One of the greatest and most important laws of physics is the conservation of energy. This video will focus on the conservation of mechanical energy. Mechanical energy, which we sometimes use Me for, is equal to the sum of kinetic and potential energies. A subset of conservation of energy says that the total mechanical energy of an object remains constant as long as there is no friction acting on the object. Of course, friction and air resistance would kind of go together there. So what we're saying is that at any time during something's motion, the mechanical energy of that object will remain the same as long as there's no friction. Now there's a lot of uh, things in real life that this explains. We're going to look at how to uh, analyze problems using conservation of energy. Here are five steps that you can use for solving conservation of energy problems. In the first step, we'll define our system and verify that there is no friction. In the second step, we'll choose in the reference level, or a point where the potential energy is zero. Then we'll identify two points. One will be our initial point, and one will be our final point. And for one of those points, we'll be given information, and the other we're trying to find something. Then we'll write out a conservation of energy equation and identify the unknown quantity. Lastly, we'll solve for that unknown quantity using variables, and then we'll plug numbers in and solve for its value. So let's see how those five steps play out in a problem. In this problem, we have a diver who's dropping from a board that is 10 meter above the water surface. We'll start by trying to find the diver's speed at the water surface, or in other words, immediately before he enters the water. Okay, so the first thing is to define your system. In this case, our system is just the diver. Sometimes we may have multiple objects, but here it's just the diver. We are assuming that there is no air resistance, as we always do, and this diver is not in contact with anything other than the air, and so there's no friction. Step two says to define a reference level. When you do step two, you should indicate somehow what the reference level is. I'll say it just by saying, the reference level is water surface. So our object, the diver, has gravitational potential energy any time that he or she is not at that reference level. So any time that he or she is above or below the surface of the water. Step three is to figure out your point. So a point where we know something and a point where we're looking for something. Well, the point where we're looking for something is pretty clear. We're looking for the speed at the water's surface. So that'll be one of our points. I also know information about where the diver starts. I know that he starts 10 meters above the water's surface. So those are going to be my two points, the diver's starting point and the water's surface. Next, I'll write out a conservation of energy equation. And when I write out this conservation of energy equation, I'll write all of the types of energy he could have before and after. So our diver could have kinetic energy. Our diver could have gravitational potential energy. And our diver could have elastic potential energy. Same thing, at the water surface, our diver could have all of these three types of energy as well. Now I'm going to take a look at it and ask what types he actually has. So when our diver starts, it says that he drops from a board. Drops, when you're dropping something, that usually means that it starts out with a velocity of zero which means our diver starts with no kinetic energy. Also looking at this, elastic potential energy means that there's springs involved. Now, while technically a diving board does give a little bit, that's a bit too complicated for our level of physics. 
So we have no elastic potential energy as well. When I get to the water's surface, that's my second point, I'm at the reference level. When we're at the reference level, there's no gravitational potential energy. So I'm left with initial potential energy, gravitational potential energy that is, is equal to final kinetic energy. Now we'll go ahead and plug in the equations for each of those. MGH initial equals one half m v initial squared. Sorry, v final squared. Now one thing I can do to make my life a bit easier is divide both sides by mass. When I do this, mass cancels out. So even though the problem gave us the diver's weight, we didn't have to use it. it. Makes our lives easier. The next thing I'll do is multiply both sides of my equation by 2. And then I'll take the square root of both sides because that speed is what I'm looking for. The square root of 2g h initial. Okay, so at this point, I have the square root of 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared. Remember, when we're dealing with gravitational potential energy, we never use a negative with that value of g. Times the initial height, which is 10 meters. Plugging that into my calculator, I find that my diver is going 14 meters per second. Now the problem said to find the diver's speed, and since it said speed, that's a scalar. I don't have to give a direction with that. So that's my final answer for part A. Let's now look at part B. Part B says find the diver's speed five meters above the water's surface. The way that part B is different is that we have a different final point. So we'll stick with that initial point of where he drops from the diving board. But my final point is going to be different, which will change my conservation of energy equation. So for part B, I'll start off as I started in part A with KE initial plus initial gravitational potential energy plus initial elastic potential energy plus final kinetic energy plus final gravitational potential energy plus final elastic potential energy. Just as before, at my initial point, I only have gravitational potential energy. But my final point is different. Now, I am no longer at the reference level at my final point. The reference level is at the water's surface, and my final point is 5 meters above that water's surface. So I can't cross out gravitational potential energy this time, but I can cross out elastic potential energy because we still do not have a spring in our problem. So plugging in the equations for each of these types of energy, <clears throat> I have that mgh initial equals 1 half mv final squared plus mgh final. And just as I did before, I can divide both sides by mass. Now be really careful when you do this. On the right hand side, to be able to cancel out this mass in the denominator, it must appear in both of the terms in the numerator, which it does here, so I'm allowed to cancel it out. Again, I'm solving for v final squared, and right now I have gh initial equals 1 half v final squared plus gh final. And so I'll subtract GH final from both sides. So I get GH initial minus GH final equals one half V final squared. Next I'll multiply both sides by two. 
And then I'll take the square root of both sides. So v final is the square root of 2. I'm going to pull the g out. 9.8 meters per second squared times h initial, which is 10 meters, minus h final, which is 5 meters. Plugging all of that into my calculator gives me a final speed of 9.90 meters per second. Even though he's gone half the distance, it's clear to see that his velocity is not half of what it was before. Let's try one more problem that uses conservation of energy, just to see how it's done one more time. This one talks about a bird flying. The bird is flying with a speed of 18 meters per second over water when it accidentally drops a 2 kilogram fish. We know what the altitude of the bird was, and we know that we're, not, we're ignoring air resistance so we want to find the speed of the fish when it hits the water. Now this is a problem that you could have done back in the chapter about two-dimensional motion. But we're going to look at this in the light of conservation of energy, and you may find that it's actually a little bit easier when we look at it in that light, when we're dealing with conservation of energy, rather than what you did with projectile motion. So for starters, our system, in this case our system is just that fish, once again. We're just looking at that object that's moving, um, ignoring the bird for the most part. And it tells us that we're disregarding air resistance and our fish is not touching anything, so there can be no friction. That was step one. Step two is to choose a reference level. And in this case, the reference level is going to be the water. And again, I'm indicating what level I chose somewhere as I'm doing the problem. Step three is to write out that, oh, sorry, figure out your initial and final points. So I know uh, some information about the fish when it was dropped from the bird. That's my initial point. My final point is going to be when it hits the water. And of course, we're talking about just barely before it hits the water, not when it actually makes contact with the water. So now I can write out a conservation of energy equation, just as we did before. Ke initial plus Peg initial plus Peb initial equals Ke final plus Peg final plus Pe final. Okay. So thinking about this problem, um, the fish was in the bird's mouth before it was dropped. And that means that the fish was moving, so it does have an initial kinetic energy. In my initial point when it's in the fish's mouth, it is not at the reference level, so it does have gravitational potential energy. However, it does not have elastic potential energy because there are no springs involved in this problem. My final point is right immediately before it hits the water. It's moving, so it has kinetic energy. It's at the reference level, so it does not have gravitational potential energy. And once again, there are no springs involved, so it does not have elastic potential energy. So writing out the equations for each of these types of energy, I have 1 half m v initial squared plus m g h initial equals one-half m v final squared. Just as we did in the previous problem, we'll divide both sides by mass. So on the right-hand side, mass cancels out. On the left-hand side, mass also cancels out because it is in both terms of the numerator. Again, that's important. So I'm left with one-half v initial squared plus g h initial equals one-half v final squared. I'm trying to find v final, so I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 2. When I multiply this left-hand side by 2, I have to distribute that 2 to both terms. So I end up getting v initial squared plus 2g h initial equals v final squared. And lastly, I'll take the square root of both sides.
so v final is the square root of v initial. And in this problem, v initial is 18 meters per second. And then I have to square that. Plus 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times 5.4 meters. That was that initial height. Plugging all of that into my calculator gives me an answer of 20.7 meters per second. Again, it said speed, not velocity, so I don't need to worry about a direction. Hopefully, this uh, video has given you a good introduction to how to solve conservation of energy problems.